first of all, thank you to uh, Peace Action Maine and Greater Brunswick Peace Works, um, Peace Works, who are really the organizations that pulled this thing together. If it weren't for them, we wouldn't be here today. Um, our program, and I want to thank all of you for coming out on this wintry day. Uh, the program is in two parts. The first part of the program is going to deal with the olive harvesting tour, which a number of us uh, will be talking about. And the second part of this event is going to be um, with Amos Libby, who's a renowned and very good speaker on this subject. He spoke in this very room a couple of years ago. Um, and he's going to talk about his time that he spent in Hebron, or Hebron, I think about four weeks there. Uh, and he'll be talking about that and have a slideshow. Now, what I'm going to do is sort of set the stage for then the other speakers who are on the tour, the olive, olive harvest tour. Each person will have around eight to ten minutes, and um, <clears throat> we'll be trying to keep time on people and letting them know when they're running out of time so that we don't squeeze out any of Amos's time. Also, uh, we'd like to have some time, maybe questions at the end. So six Mainers, uh, as part of nine people from the USA, there was one, I believe, from Massachusetts and two from California. Uh, nine Mainers went to uh, Palestine on a harvest tour to pick olives in the last half of October of 2017. Um, there were around nine European countries represented and around 40 or so Europeans who were there. Um, we went to four or five different orchards around the city of uh, Bethlehem and <clears throat> helped families pick their olives. We stayed in a hotel in Beit Sahur, and there may be, uh, I mean, I wonder, is, is it possible to get these lights up here off? Because our slides could be a lot more effective if we had a little darkness. Yeah. Um, we'll probably, we might, you, get, you might get a shot of that hotel um, up from looking down on the uh, courtyard, just to show you that, um, to go over there, and we're hoping that some of you will maybe want to go next year. Sally and I are planning to go back, and we'd love to have some people going with us. There it is. Uh, that's not a swimming pool down there. That's a little reflection pool. But, but you're not going to be sleeping in, uh, you know, roach-infested areas. I mean, it's a, nice, it's a nice hotel. It's a nice hotel. So let me say a few things about this trip setting the stage. I would say about a third to a half of the Europeans who were there were young people. And you'll see pictures of them. That was very, very heartening. And by young people, I mean, nowadays, I, I, I may maybe mean people in their 50s, but I'm talking about people in their 20s and 30s. A lot of young people were there. One man who was there from Denmark was the head of the YWCA there, YMCA, and he was on a sabbatical. And he told me that earlier in the year, um, when in April, when this olive tree planting time, about 50 young people from Denmark came over there. And then when they went back after doing their planting and listening to people speak to them about Israel-Palestine, when they went back, they just spread out across the country taking the message. It was a very um, heartening experience. There was the joy of hearing all of these different languages. I remember one time in particular, that I was under a tree picking olives, and I realized that I, I was listening to some German, I was listening to a Scandinavian language, and then I was listening to French. And then these women who were speaking French suddenly broke into the pee-off song of La Vie en Rose. And uh, it was that kind of experience that one, one was able to have. There's also, uh, for a guy my age, there was the fun of actually being able to climb trees again. As, as, a, as another elder guy who was there from England, he said, how else can you climb trees without people thinking you're crazy? So 
you could either have a ladder leaning up against the tree or you could actually go into the trunk and climb up and, and be picking. So it was great. Oh, yeah, Sally's found. And there I am uh, up in the tree. So it, that, that was fun. That was a lot of fun. Our speakers today um, are Christy Hammer, who's an associate professor of sociology at USM, uh, Eve Sawyer. Eve, are you here yet? She was doing something, she's a musician, and as a musician, she's been busy doing something else musically today, but uh, if she doesn't get here in time, we'll put her in elsewhere. Then Kathy Keenitz, who is an elder law attorney. Uh, Payne Ratner, who is a raconteur. Uh, he is a writer of radio commercials. He's also a dramatist and a very good one. I've read some of his plays, and he's a superb actor. He assures me that he gets all tongue-tied when he has to talk just in front of an audience and he's not acting a script. But I told him well, this will be a very kind audience and um, he'll be fine. Then um, my wife, Sally Bodenscheibel, will be talking at the end and she's going to talk about uh, some Buddhists that she met while she was there. She went over there in part to meet some Israeli Buddhists and about a project a uh, website, um, is that the right word, website, or is it blog site, website, how many minutes have I used, are you, are you watching me, no. oh, <laughs> okay, uh, well I probably have used my 10 minutes, then um, at the end of this, if during the uh, question and answer period, or maybe if we're running ahead on our regular rule presentations, I would like to say a few things about my experience with uh, some very concrete, small stage apartheid um, fact, facts in the little town of Al Ram in the West Bank. And then also maybe to say a couple of things about a middle school, a Palestinian middle school that I was able to visit and my experience there, a school which is run uh, and controlled, the curriculum is controlled by Israel. But um, I may not have time for that, but we'll see. All right, now, so Christy Hammer is the first person who's going to come up. So Christy, where are you? There you go. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a teacher at USM. I had the delight of teaching a number of years with Bob Scheibel before we kicked him out. No, before he retired. And um, I had been wanting to go to see the Middle East for myself, to see it with my own eyes. For a long time, many people have told me that you really don't understand uh, the plight of the Palestinians until you see it with your own eyes. Uh, Sarah Yal Hershorn, that just wrote a fascinating book studying, uh, interviewing the settlers, the many uh, uh, American and uh, Canadian uh, Jewish settlers that moved uh, to the West Bank, said the same thing to me. I'm so glad you're getting to see it with your own eyes. My dissertation advisor at University of New Hampshire was Palestinian. Bud Clafe. So I grew up, uh, so to speak, uh, hearing about the Middle East and, and knowing what Bob and Sally say that they realized eventually there was a different story, different narrative. So I, I knew that, I suppose, by my, my late 20s. Uh, I also studied a lot about race and racism in uh, American schools, uh, anti-racism. And so I wanted to see what, uh, what it appeared on the ground as well, just to what extent of what the situation is really just bottom line racism against the uh, Palestinians. Um, when, I, when I went there, one of the very first things you notice is that, uh, just like the Israeli leader had named it, the, the Swiss cheese model of putting in the settlements, meaning that they almost look chaotic, like they're all over, and if it's supposed to be about security for Israelis and the settlers, why aren't they kind of more clumped together? No, they're individual settlements in a, in a kind of chaotic, but is spread apart as breaking up Palestinian land absolutely as much as possible. And I think just seeing that and how successful they've uh, been in building uh, the, the, I say Jewish settlements, you know, the, there's six million uh, settlers, uh, we heard some good arguments that of the last million that were mostly all from Russia, there was a good proportion, someone said up to 60% what were fake, that they weren't even Jewish, but they were able to come from Russia, get the free houses, get the get you know military, uh, get arms you know for their houses uh, to guard against the, the the bad Palestinians. 
And so it's really kind of a crazy situation. We heard from many Palestinian youth that the Israeli guards are, are, that are abusing them all the time are talking in Russian, so they're not even talking Hebrew anymore. So the extent that the, the situation is, is just crazy about that, about the mix of religion and ethnicity and who gets to come there. And of course the settlers are terribly afraid of the Palestinians. There's big signs in and out of the settlements. Where, be, beware, you're going into a dangerous area. I grew up in uh, a, a, a what would be considered a liberal, maybe moderate, my, mainstream uh, a Christian Protestant church. And I, and like other pain I know talks about this, you just don't criticize Israel. We were taught, you know, you just to be a good American, you don't criticize uh, uh, Israel. And so to go there and to see what we've done in the name of Israel, in the name of, of post-Holocaust, uh, where Jewish people can go for as their home from all over the world, uh, is, is, is very discouraging. Uh, you not only see the settlements in the Swiss cheese model, but also just so carefully how they took all the very best land and they build at the top of the hill and then you sort of, because that makes it look like powerful, and then they build more and more settlements down the hill. And going with Bob and Sally was really something because they'd been there several times and time and time again as we drove around, they'd say, oh, that was a beautiful green hill, now it's a settlement. That was another beautiful uh, uh, hill, now it's a settlement. The, the renaming of Arab Artifacts. This is right in Jerusalem with biblical and other historical sounding names, right? That was all over the place. Uh, someone called it the Hebronization of East Jerusalem, how much that's happening now in East Jerusalem as it did in, in Hebron. And this is, of course, in the right around the walls of, of uh, Jerusalem. Time and time again, the Arab names are taken off and they're given, sometimes made up names, often from the Bible, so when people go in and see it. There's also another picture, I think, here of, um, oh, this is a good one. This is, a, this is the, the, the thick, thick walls that protect, quote, unquote, one farmer and his farm. He only has this in and out access through this kind of a th huge, thick, padded wall uh, because the settlements are right in it. He had his pregnant wife dragged outside by guards and she had a miscarriage. He's been poisoned, uh, attacked numerous times, offered millions and millions of dollars, probably US dollars to sell his farm, but he doesn't want to sell it. And, but it's completely, this is wall, how they're now, the, they've had to wall off just one of the olive farms and the little you know, uh, farmer's household and a few of his relatives. And this is the, his entrance in and out. More of the settlements that you see all over. One thing I want to mention, I bet my time is running out uh, in Jerusalem, thank you, is um, about the second Wailing Wall. Does everybody know about the second Wailing Wall? Have you visited the Wailing Wall? The second Wailing Wall. And what the second Wailing Wall is, and, and that was probably the only time I saw the Israeli guards, particularly have very dour and, and, and kind of nasty, angry looks, because I don't think many people are supposed to go back to the second Wailing Wall yet, but there's already signs up for it. And you went down a passageway on the edge of the, the walled part of, of, of Jerusalem, and towards it, what looked like an exit, probably it will be an entrance once this gets going. And there were guards there, and then you did a hard left, and I saw you saw a big sign, Second Wailing Wall. It was right there, you know, on, uh, onto the wall. And then you kept walking down a little bit, and you came into a big large open room, open air room, but large room. And he said, and then you saw another sign, the second wailing wall. They are made up and actually supposedly really down the way, like another maybe half a mile on the other, in the center of Jerusalem, uh, a third of a mile. There is the actual wailing wall. So they decided this wall right over by where Palestinians live in Jerusalem, that could be the second wailing wall. So they're putting up signs and once that becomes enough of a tourist attraction and people want to see the second wailing wall, that's all they need to say it's secure and now you, can, you have to leave your homes and they'll just be able to kick more Palestinians uh, around this second wailing wall. So just the games that are played, the rebadging and the, re, the renaming, the rewriting of, of history is quite remarkable, as well as I think this, this phenomenon of the second wailing wall is, is quite am, uh, amazing too. I guess the last thing I would say is someone who read Tycoon in the 80s, uh, the, you know, that magazine, the Jewish voice that could be critical of Israel, is a, 
and I know Bob and Sally, they work with Israelis, with Jewish people more and more than ever before in their peace work. The other side of it, many academics like me, my husband, many Jewish academics, they just won't go there. They'll just say, we cannot criticize Israel. So the, I think it's, it, 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 it's on, I think part of the, the little blood on the hands of people in the US are particularly Jewish intellectuals in the academy that, that uh, are not happy to talk about Palestine and where else will Jews go and, and um, uh, just won't talk about Israel, can't face it. One of my buddies, a professor at USM, it was their daughter that went there and she came back, 20, 21 year old, and said, we're treating them, we're keeping them like animals. And she got her dad, this is last, he's a uh, successful lawyer in Portland, she teaches at USM. She, he was angry the last time I talked to him because he couldn't find what they, the deal was, if the checks I write, 10,000 or something a year, he writes to a synagogue to support Israel, if he can't confirm that that money's not going to the settlements, he would stop writing the checks to Israel because he agreed with her, yes, that's bad, that's wrong, illegal, whatever. And he was annoyed because he couldn't, his, his rabbi couldn't tell him that no, the money he sends through his synagogue isn't supporting the settlements. But, so, but if they didn't have that daughter that went there, they wouldn't have had the wake up call or the ability to talk out at all. Okay, I think that with, with that, uh, I'll, I'll pass it on to whoever's the next speaker. Pain. Hi, I, I suppose like everybody, um, I, I grew up with the whole uh, just accepting the fact that there was no, um, that there was, it was terrorism versus, um, versus Israel. And um, again, as, as Christy said, when you go there and you see, um, you realize the story is, is completely false. Um, it's just hard to see people being crushed. And what we walked into was the slow, very slow um, annihilation of a group of people. I mean, of course, people are fighting back, and I don't think that will be the ultimate outcome. But that was my experience, which I didn't really expect to have. Um, the country is beautiful. The olives were were wonderful to to remove from the tree, and the experience of camaraderie was wonderful with all of these Europeans. Um, but underlying all of that was this slow demolition of of a of a people. Um, uh, I remember seeing a home that had been recently built, and within uh, sorry, within. Um, I, I was hoping it was my time to get off. <laughs> but um, the, the, the home was, was slowly built by Palestinians, and Israeli soldiers watched it being built. And when it was finally built and the family ready to move in, the government asked them to, or demanded that they tear it down. So the, the family had to tear down the, the home that they had just built, and then they had to pay the Israeli government um, what it cost for the bulldozers to run and the soldiers to monitor. All of these people, I, I guess it's the, the irony that I kept coming back to, which is that um, the Holocaust is being re recreated, that uh, ghettos are formed. We, we sort of went through once um, sort of a refugee camp and watched um, these really beautiful children playing in all concrete. It was a concrete maze. And the only time they sort of ventured toward a field, uh, and it, uh, uh, there was a sudden loud explosion, and um, an Israeli soldier had just thrown a kind of a sound grenade into this field, and they were, the kids were startled. And we, we turned and looked, and there was an Israeli soldier leveling his gun at us. And we all sort of just slowly walked back down the alley where it was safe. Um, all the time, these people are are trying to live their lives, um, and, and they are being reminded that they are second-class citizens. They try to go to work, and if they don't have an enormous amount of paperwork to to um, allow them to pass through the maze of bureaucracy they are jailed. 
I don't think there was one Palestinian man that I talked to, not one, that had not spent time in an Israeli jail, not for anything we would consider criminal, but for uh, trying to live a life, trying to get a job, trying to walk from point A to point B. Um, so here were these beautiful people. Um, I remember we were at Old Jerusalem and, and Kathy was, um, found this friend of hers from a previous trip who was selling there in the stall. And um, they, they don't <laughs> clear, obviously have much. And um, Kathy found something she wanted to, to buy and, and this lady who you know is struggling for a living wouldn't let her buy it. She said, no, you must take it. It's yours, it's yours, it's yours. So, um, so we had to secretly buy like a lot of other things, but she, no, she was, um, so I, basically I'm just saying it was a, it was a very eye-opening experience and we saw um, people trying to live their lives in a slowly more and more oppressive world. Um, I don't know, that's about it. Um, thank you, thank you. Hello everyone, um, uh, let's see. Oh my God! Yes, it is me. It's, it, I swear to God, it is me. And it is. Uh, I'm at the top of one of the olive trees. I have to tell you. I have to tell you. I am a tree climber. So when I first heard, after I'd been buying Palestinian olive oil exclusively for about uh, I don't know four or five years, thinking I'm doing my one tiny, tiny little thing to help. Palestinian farmers that I'd heard a lot about, uh, when I found out that one could actually go on a trip to Palestine and pick the olives, be up in the trees and pick the olives uh, to make this olive oil that I'd been eating all these years. Uh, oh, wait a minute. That last picture. Oh my gosh, I didn't think that one had come out. Oh, you must have gotten more than I thought. Okay. Uh, but. Okay, hold that, hold that thought, hold that picture. Um, so when I got there, I was absolutely in just bliss. When we got out into the, uh, the olive orchards and I found that I could actually get up into the trees and get into the top of the trees, uh, that, was, that was the very, very, it was just glorious, glorious. I felt, so, I felt like I was close to heaven. Um, the picking, the actual picking of the olives was, uh, was fun on most of the trees because it was very satisfying work, stri stripping the branches and filling up the tarps. Wait, did you already talk about that? No. no. Okay. Um, and so <laughs> I just, I was having the time of my life. Um, I have to tell you this particular picture in the background you can see what is actually one of the colonies, or they're called settlements, uh, that are illegally, it's land that was illegally seized by uh, is the Israeli government and um, from the Palestinians. And I just wanted to show in this picture how close we were picking to uh, some of the settlements. And actually, we were a lot closer in uh, a number of places. Um, huge takeaway for me from this trip, besides the bliss of being up in those uh, beautiful uh, olive trees, was also a huge amount of, um, um, oh my God, sadness. Uh, when I heard about some of the very old, old trees, thousands, oh, at least a thousand years old, that um, Israeli, uh, the Israeli government had actually just bulldozed. And I'm thinking, my God, these trees were, helping these farmers to make a living, make some sort of a life, um, and to just have them annihilated like that was, uh, it made me very, very sad. So anyway, this picture right here is a uh, on my way from the family that I was staying with to the hotel to um, meet up with all my pals who were picking olives, uh, was a long stretch of uh, roadway that was, it didn't have too much on the sides. It was kind of um, kind of yucky walking along there. But one morning, I happened to see this flock of sheep 
in what looks like sort of a, a dump with a uh, shepherd there. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. I only saw him one day. But just to see that um, scene on the side of the road just kind of struck me um, uh, in a tender spot. Now, across the street from that, as I was walking back and forth from the house where I was staying, which was about a mile from the hotel, there was a big open uh, pit, cement pit, that had um, burning trash in it whenever I walked by. You know, so you're walking by and the smoldering smoke smells of kind of not such wonderful stuff being burned in there uh, was just an example of me for how the Palestinians have to really take care of themselves without having any services that the government's providing. There's no trash pickup in that particular place, so they had to just take care of all that themselves. Um, yeah, I was amazed when I said, oh, this is another great picture. Oh, wait a minute, this story. Okay, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna try to keep it short. The woman that I was staying with, the, the family, it was Nadiman and George. Uh, Nadiman was a member of the Church of the Nativity, which is uh, a, a Christian church in uh, Beit Sahur, I think it was in Beit Sahur. Well, anyway, somewhere in Bethlehem. And reportedly, under the church is the place where Jesus was actually born. And Nariman is kneeling in front of this uh, beautifully decorated spot. There's a big star on the floor, and it says, Jesus Christ was born here. And what we're supposed to do is go in and, and kiss the star when you get in there. In order to get into the church, yes, there's Nariman again, and I, I titled this, This is Nariman Giving Eve a Bible Lesson. Now, most people, all the tourists I could see lining up to get into the church to see where Jesus had been born, there was about a four-hour wait to get in there. And Nariman kept saying, no, no, come with me, come with me. So, since she was an actual member of the church, she was able to talk with the priest and say, could I please bring my friend from the US down to see? So I felt terrible <laughs> walking past all these people that had another two or three or four hour wait. And I was getting to just go down the marble steps. You might even have a picture of the marble steps. Oh, no, OK. Well, anyway, these marble steps going down into the place where uh, supposedly Jesus was born in the stable. And I guess there must have been a stable there about 2,000 years ago. So this picture portrays um, the, uh, the story of Herod, who, when he found out that this uh, Jesus kid was supposed to become the king, wanted to slaughter all the, the babies in that area so that he wouldn't be uh, un, un dethroned by this kid that had been born. And so this is a picture of the children being slaughtered on the bottom, and then up in the top is all the children in heaven, all their, all their souls. They're, so they've, they all went to heaven, certainly. And Nariman was, uh, this was one of the uh, paintings that was down deep in the, uh, the bottom part of the church where no, there were no other people around there. So I thought, whoa, this is pretty special that I happened to stay with a wonderful family who was, uh, who was, um, uh, who were part of that congregation. Um, now, oh, another small story I'll tell is that uh, I came away with a um, uh, not a very positive and warm feeling, and I, I'm almost sorry to say this uh, for the um, uh, Islamic uh, mosques because. Uh, my bedroom must have been about, uh, my side of the house must have been near one of the mosques. So at five o'clock every morning, <laughs> and waking up to this <laughs> every morning um, was not the most pleasant alarm clock. Now, granted, it only lasted for five minutes, but then every morning at 5.45, I don't know why, 5.45. Oh, well, same thing. So, is that a, oh, two more minutes. OK, great, great, great. Um, now, no, I, I felt very, very happy that I was able to stay with a family. Um, and they had four grown children who were all outside. They were not there in, uh, in Bethlehem at that time. 
And Nariman was a fabulous hostess. Oh my God, she just wanted to take care of me. She wanted to make her best, best meals for me. And uh, I actually brought a little tool that she had reamed out carrots. Now I've heard of stuffed zucchini, but I had never heard of stuffed carrots before. And the things that they were stuffed with rice and the most amazing flavorful spices. So uh, she, she really took very, very nice care of me. And when I asked her, oh, how did you do that? She explained to me that you need this special tool. It's a, a long blade. And I said, oh, where can I get one of those? I'll, I'll have to buy one. She said, oh, no, you may take mine. This one, the hand, obviously, she had had it for a long time because it was very worn. It's, it's a very dear, dear thing that I was able to bring home. I haven't made the stuffed carrots yet, but <laughs> I do intend to. Um, oh, man, I have other stories, but I think I've <laughs> I better wrap it up. Um, I, I would definitely go back again. Um, I have to find a better way to travel there. Uh, it's <laughs> I need to somehow learn how to astrally project. I, I can't handle those, those air, airplane flights. Um, this was a picture I took. This was, this was terrifying to me to see all these soldiers um, with guns just out there uh, protecting somebody. Um, maybe they were protecting them from me. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I've blathered on enough. So many things to talk about. Um, <coughs> just kind of following up with what Bob was just saying, um, I think it's worth a mention the water issue, which is a huge issue. Um, the West Bank, which I think most of you know, is designated as Palestinian territory, and which has been just chopped up. Um, the Swiss cheese that Christie's talking about, the, the holes are actually not the settlements. The holes are the parts that are that the Palestinians can, can be freely um, living in. Um, that's how much of that's how much of Palestine has been overtaken by Israel. But water, um, the West Bank sits on a huge water reserve, and that water is taken out by Israel and um, sold to the Palestinians. Um, if, you, if you go to the, the settlements, which should be called colonies because they're illegal by United Nations standards. They should never have been built there. This is occupied territory. It's been occupied for 50 years. And they have no right under any tenets of um, international law to be building there. And there are over a half a million people, and colonies are continuing to be built. But anyway, you can, you can go to the settlements, and you can see them watering their lawns, filling their swimming pools, while the Palestinians have to buy water and store it on tanks on the top of their buildings and hope that it lasts for a couple of weeks. I lived um, in Bethlehem for about a month, two and a half years ago, and I worked in Hebron. And I experienced the water issue. There were two times in my month there that I ran out of water. And you know, various issues with the tank. Um, so you, know, you get by without water for a couple of days. Um, and even more insidiously, it's, it's sport for some of these um, settlers to go around and shoot the tanks of Palestinians. It's horrible. The WHO, the World Health Organization, has said that um, Palestinians are being allocated a quarter of the water that's recommended for humans to live. So it's a dire situation. Um, one point I wanted to make about the trip, which was wonderful. I mean, this trip, it was such a contrast of beautiful things and just sad tragic, horrific things. Um, this particular olive picking venture was coordinated by the um, Palestinian YMCA, YWCA, in conjunction with a really wonderful tourism group located in Bet Sahur, which is a um, suburb of Bethlehem. 
called um, Alternative Tourism Group, ATG. If you're ever gonna go to Palestine, I strongly, strongly recommend that you um, hook up with ATG. They're wonderful. And they've been doing these tours for a number of years, <clears throat> and most recently in conjunction with the YMCA, YWCA. And they, the reason is not just to bring people over there to experience Palestine, which in, in itself is a wonderful thing, but the reason is that many of these farmers, their land has been so encroached upon by Israel and by settlements that they cannot safely go to their own fields to pick their olives. And so um, having internationals there, helping them is obviously a lot of labor. There were actually close to 70 of us. Um, we filled two buses. And so I felt like we were just this, this um, swarm of, um, of working bees, and we you know, descended upon these trees and picked. In one case, there was one farm where we picked over 100 bags that stood waist high, um, masses of olives. It was beautiful. Um, but all of these farmers that they choose to help, and th the farmers have to apply and be accepted, and, and there are many more farmers who would like to have this sort of help than they can um, give to. But they all have issues, like the, the one that I believe Christy was talking about, where his farm has been, his entire farm has been cut off by the wall, and this massive steel gate, I don't know if we have a good picture of the steel gate. Okay, well anyway, a massive steel gate that was constructed by Israel so this farmer could go into his own farm and no one else is allowed to go there but he and his family unless he gets special permission from the Israeli government. So we had the permission that day, thank God, so we were able to go and pick his olives and man, were these farmers grateful to us. So. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Hebron. We visited Hebron. Um, it's really only about a half hour away from Bethlehem as the crow flies, but because of the circuitous route that you have to take now as a Palestinian or anyone going into the Palestinian territories that have been so bifurcated by the settlements and by the Jewish-only roads that lead to the settlements and you know, cut through farms and land and villages. Um, it takes more like two hours to get to Hebron. And um, Hebron right now is one of the hotbeds of the controversy, the Israeli-Palestinian controversy. <clears throat> Hebron for the past, I don't know, 800 years has been almost exclusively Palestinian. There have been Jewish people that have lived there peacefully. There have been altercations over the years. But um, the right-wing, you know, uber-Zionist, fundamentalist Jews feel that Hebron, even though it's smack in the middle of Palestinian territory, they feel that Hebron should be part of Israel. In fact, you know, there are many of these Zionists who say, Israel, you know, we're going to take all of Israel from, um, from the Mediterranean to the Jordan River, you know. So, so the design of many of these um, right-wing Zionists is that they're going to eventually get it all. And so Hebron is in the middle of it, and it has particular significance because it has the, um, the tomb of the patriarchs, which is in a mosque. It's in the al Ibrahimi mosque, Ibrahimi being Abraham, you know, the father of, of Christianity, Judaism, um, Islam basically, you know, the, the people of the book, they all share Abraham. And so there's this mosque that happens to sit on what they believe, there's no proof of this, but what they believe to be the place where Abraham was buried. So it has huge historical religious significance to all three religions. But it has been a mosque for the past 800 years. Well, oop, only two minutes. So. Um, so in 1994, a man who happened to be from Brooklyn, New York, named Baruch Goldstein, um, was a Jewish settler and a doctor, a physician. And he went into the mosque during a worship service with a AK, you know, some super gun. A what? 
a Galil rifle, whatever that is. I know nothing about guns, but it was a big one. And he mowed down 29 Palestinians. And they, the Palestinians who survived, mobbed him and killed him, kind of understandably. And, and then there were riots following that. Um, and because there were riots, the police came in and basically shut down the whole Shuhada Street, which was the main street of commerce in Israel, caused, I'm sorry, in Hebrew, um, barred, they literally, I don't, we, I wish I had pictures of this, but they literally, okay, they welded the doors shut to Palestinian businesses and homes. And, and that whole street now, you, it's, it's like a ghost town. And there are checkpoints all over the place because a group, a very small group of, again, fundamentalist, Zionist, Jewish um, settlers have come in and made their presence there because their, their idea is they're going to take that area over. And so it has made, it has made life for this predominantly Palestinian city Actually, I think it's the largest city. It's the largest city, and they've made life miserable there. And these soldiers, they intimidate, they, they, you know, they, they're a horrible, horrible presence. And um, they've turned life upside down for these people. I think my time is up, so thank you. And uh, there are so many photos that I'd love to show you. Um, that we have. Um, one of the reasons I embedded many slides of children um, is that a, a pleasure for me every time I go is seeing family life and specifically seeing children running around freely uh, with smiles and um, the hugging and the, the, the tenderness between parents and children. And um, it breaks my heart to think that these children that are so innocent at, this, at those points in their lives will grow up in, in an environment that um, uh, could easily harden the heart. But what we find when we've gone is uh, that the Palestinian people are some of the most generous, warm, um, kind people that I've ever met. And as one person said, don't romanticize us, because they have, there are certainly problems. Um, but the, the response that we've had when we've gone has been um, just uh, overwhelmingly of generosity and kindness. So I, one of the things that I wanted to talk about was a project that I'm working on. I've been, um, I'm a practicing Buddhist and I have been for many, many years and I have attempted in various ways, shape or form to engage the Buddhist community in this, in this uh, issue with, with virtually no success. What I am told frequently is that we support what you're doing but when it comes to speaking out about what is happening, there is silence. When I go to Israel-Palestine, one of the things that I have attempted to do is to meet up with people who are also Buddhists, and most, mostly these would be Israeli Buddhists, so Israeli Jews who are Buddhists, practicing Buddhists. And I have, in the process, met, met some uh, lovely, wonderful people who are doing what they can. Um, three people in particular, Stephen Folder, who is, was the founder of uh, Insight Meditation Communities, in, the, the Insight Meditation Community in Israel. Um, he is now living on a kibbutz and his basically way away from any of the city life. But he, uh, we spent, uh, he, we spent an, an afternoon, um, an Israeli friend of mine, Iris Doten, who is a psychologist, an activist, and Buddhist, she and I spent an afternoon with Stephen, and um, he gets it. He absolutely gets it. And it was, it was heartening, except that I, he's now off because it's just very hard. 
Iris is, um, again, a friend of mine. We spent two nights uh, before we left Israel, Palestine, um, spent two nights with her, spent a lot of time talking about activism um, and about Buddhism and how we can work together to try to bring the Buddhist voice into the interfaith um, action and dialogue. Um, and then um, this man named Aviv Tartarsky, who is involved with uh, a sangha, a meditation community in uh, Tel Aviv. And he and I met at the Jerusalem Hotel in their little cafe um, and had a wonderful conversation. Um, and what I will say is one of the things that happened right off was I, I felt his reserve. Um, his reserve also as I'm sitting uh, with two Palestinian friends, I have some photographs afterwards, I'll, I'll, I'll show you some of those, but um, my friend Abir and my friend Chetam, who is Gazan, um, and Abir is from Bethlehem and teaches at Bethlehem University. Hatem is a, a friend of my daughter's, as is Abir. We met them, and we were meeting together, um, joyfully you know, seeing them, and we hadn't seen them for a long time, at the Jerusalem Hotel when Aviv shows up to meet with me. He sits down at the table with us, and it, it's clear that it's, it's difficult. Um, our friend Hatem, who is Gazan, is... The, such an open-hearted woman. She just graciously and fully embraced Aviv, gave her, gave him her contact information, um, said, please call me, you know, I'm happy to talk with you, meet with you. And Abir really didn't want to engage much with him for understandable reasons. The, what her family has gone through has been pretty extraordinary, living in Ramallah. So I met with Aviv and told him a little bit about what I was hoping to do. And um, in, 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 with guidance from a meditation teacher, a mentor, uh, Tanisara, I've come up with this um, title, Buddhist Alliance for Nonviolence and Human Rights in Israel-Palestine. And looking at um, the Buddhism as, a, as social act, action, that spiritual practice is also, social action is also spiritual practice. And so trying to bring together two parts of my life that are very important to me around this very, very important issue. I believe that whatever happens in this region of the world affects what happens everywhere. And so this is a project that I've just begun. I am going to be working with Iris, with uh, another Israeli um, Jew who, whose name is Noga, um, Aviv, with um, hopefully uh, there's a Palestinian woman who's interested in this. And so it's just beginning. And it will unfold in ways that I really don't know what will happen. <laughs> but I think it's going to, I, I, I'm hopeful that this may provide a internet, a website presence where Buddhists may feel more, more at ease coming and engaging, learning about this issue because a lot of Buddhists are Jewish in this country. The United States, the, the, the leaders of Buddhist um, communities, the insight communities in particular, are Jewish. They were first wave, went to uh, first wave Buddhists um, coming back from the West during the late 60s and 70s, and they are the people that started um, really bringing from, yeah, to the West, right. They, they um, started the Insight Meditation Society, Barry Center for Buddhist Studies, Spirit Rock, et cetera, et cetera, Shelburne Falls, Vipassana Retreat Center, um, and many, many others. Um, and so engaging the Buddhist community also will engage the Jewish community. And I think that um, there's, there is some cause for hope here. So I encourage you to you know, stay tuned. And if you've got ideas or wanting to engage with me, I would be delighted to talk with you. 
and we'll see how things unfold. Thank you.